So let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll pass to some readings from the scripture, and then on to our, our topic for today. Our Father in heaven, we, we lift up our hands uh, to you, and we pray particularly today uh, for the uh, situation on campus. If there's somebody who's had uh, the COVID virus, that, that they'll be uh, healed, uh, and that it did not spread uh, on, on campus and will not spread. Uh, we, we pray, Lord, uh, for great wisdom in all of these uh, stressful situations that we face, particularly for, for peace uh, and uh, reliance on you in this, this time where our peace comes from. Our Father in heaven, as we, we turn to our studies, uh, we pray also that your wisdom may permeate and soak into and change all that we think and all that we do so that it's in conformity uh, with your love and your will and your justice. Uh, bless us, Lord, in these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, today, uh, and I suppose in, in every age, as we, as we hear in, in Romans 2, uh, people don't like the idea of a judgment, any kind of judgment, fair judgment. Judgment on, on evildoers. Nobody likes that. I don't like it. It frightens me. And it should frighten you. It frightens me because as, as we're taught here in, in Romans uh, 2, uh, I'm a sinner condemned before God according to my works. Uh, I have a big problem, which is I, I know what's right. I study God's law. I, I study uh, the, the right standards of things, and I know I fall short of them. And in, as I've grown in honesty with myself, uh, I have no defense for those, those failings. They're horrible. They're awful to me, and they're awful to God. And in the natural course of things, I would deserve judgment and condemnation. I have, I have one plea only before that righteous judgment of God's. And that's the blood of Jesus Christ shed for me. I, I put my faith not in my works, not in my righteousness, uh, but in the mercy of Jesus Christ, his death for me, his death in my place, his dying the death I deserve to die, his bearing the punishment I deserved to suffer. Uh, some people have a different attitude about Jesus Christ, which is they say, what Jesus Christ has shown us, and this is a horrible lie, what Jesus Christ has shown us is the opposite of what it says in Romans 2, which is nobody has anything to worry about because our sins aren't that bad and uh, God is merciful and there will be no judgment. There is no condemnation of sins. There, there, is, no, there is no need for man to feel the pangs of, the pang means the pain, the, the inner, inner pressing pain of, of our own judgment of our guilt, our own knowledge of our sin. Uh, that God is merciful in the sense that he does not judge. We're called not to judge, certainly. I don't judge you because you're a sinner and I'm a sinner. I don't judge you when you wrong me because... I've been forgiven of greater things than you've done to me. That's true. But it is a lie, a horrible lie, to say that in any of this teaching, Jesus or the scriptures suggest that God does not judge. God has done no wrong. God has done no wrong to you. He's done no wrong to any man. And he will judge. We have a, a vision of that in the, the 101st Psalm that we read today where the good king is presented not as somebody who ignores evil in the land, because if he ignores evil in the land, then the evil ones will destroy. God does not uh, conduct this world so that evil is not removed from it. Evil is punished. Evil is punished in this life, we're told. But there is a great judgment coming. And Paul says in the scriptures we just had, what do you imagine is happening here? You may, you may not currently be under the judgment of God because God loves you and, and longs for you to repent. 
But if you confuse God's patience with you, if you, if you confuse God's uh, willingness to put up with your anger and your greed and your lust, if you confuse those things with an absence of judgment from God, then you are deeply confused indeed. Uh, still, this is a, a popular uh, modern uh, heresy. Uh, it, is, it is very popular because it offers a very uh, cheap, inexpensive, costless kind of relief from ourselves and from God. We're told that uh, in Christianity, we've moved away from the idea of judgment. We've moved away from the idea that uh, people should be punished, that sins and wrongs and crimes deserve punishment. But I, I will tell you, however it makes you feel, you need to know. The, the Bible teaches that sin deserves punishment. There is a, a judgment coming. We were just speaking of it in, in, uh, in Romans 2. There is a time when the King of Christ will appear, the King Christ will appear in power. Jesus Christ will appear in power, and he will go through the land, and he will overturn everyone who is haughty, everyone who is deceitful, everyone who speaks ill of his brother, everyone who undermines, everyone who kills. All of the wicked shall be removed from the kingdom. Jesus talks about this in his parable of the sheep and the goats, the, the dividing between his people and the goats who are sent to eternal darkness. There is a judgment. That judgment is coming. And that judgment will be by Jesus Christ. We proclaim mercy in Jesus Christ for all who turn to him and rely on him and rely on his blood in our place. My blood that should have been shed, my punishment that I should have borne, Jesus bore it in my place. We, we preach a, a transformation of life which allows us to grow in righteousness. Grow in righteousness because of our love of God for his great mercy to us. Grow in righteousness because of our love for Jesus Christ who saved us and lets us walk like him as we walk alongside him. Uh, our, our subject today is, uh, broadly speaking, what you could call criminal law, or as I style it, non-monetary injunctions for wrong. It's an inelegant phrase, but what, what I'm getting at there is let's not prejudge what the Bible is doing. Last week, we talked about orders to pay money, situations where you could pay money, and especially situations where you couldn't pay money in recompense. Uh, bloodshed cannot be atoned for with money. We do it. We have money compensation. Uh, beginning in the early 20th century, states began to introduce money compensation uh, when somebody was killed. But previously, th that was as alien to the, the, the law of the United States as it was to the law of, of Moses. Today, we pass explicitly to the other situation. Uh, what do we do? in situations of bloodshed, particularly, where there uh, cannot be made a monetary compensation. Sometimes the Bible says, do not accept money. Money will not do. And we talked last week about the, the fundamentality, the basicness of bloodshed in the scripture. It's its own category because it relates to a, a, a higher a relation of man with God that makes every taking of life by fault or without fault something that must be responded to, accounted for in law. If you take life, uh, if you take life unintentionally, uh, you, you can uh, respond to that by going to the city of mercy and having internal exile. And if you take life intentionally, as we'll see again today, then uh, death is the the only death of the one who sheds blood is the only, only response. Uh, we're going to be on this subject for two weeks, this week and, and next week. And today I want to focus in on a, a theme that I've already introduced to you, which is uh, the modern sense that a, 
a judgment against someone because they've done something wrong is a bad idea. Um, we're, I'm going to talk to you today about what, what's sometimes called the retributive theory of justice, which is opposed to non-retributive theories. A retributive theory of criminal justice, of punishment, says very simply that we punish someone because they deserve it. The punishment is what they need. It's what is appropriate. It is what it is to be given. We punish it. We punish people because they deserve it. There are other theories of, of criminal justice which say, no, 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 no. You should never punish people because they deserve it. Such a justification, if you punish people because they deserve it, that's wrongful. You should only punish people if it will benefit society in some way. If it will deter crime, if it will incapacitate, or if it will rehabilitate. If, if it will make people afraid of committing crime, or it will make people not able to commit crime because they're locked in, in prison. Or if the experience of punishment, the way you manage it, will bring about a change in their character so that they go from, from being people who do bad things to being good things. Um, roughly, roughly speaking, as we, we go through the law, we find a great similarity between our laws and the laws of the Bible in that we all have punishments for various crimes. We punish murders. We punish thefts. We're going to talk a lot more about other kinds of punishments next week. But we see a great similarity. But I'm going to talk today about a, a global movement which says that retributive punishment is wrong. And specifically, that the retributive punishment uh, that the Bible speaks of very often, uh, the punishment by executing a wrongdoer, is not just wrong, but deeply offensive to our most fundamental civilized values. Now, before we get too far into this, it's important to observe, I've begun your, your reading today with what I, I call the imminent purpose of punishment, which just means, what does God say that punishing people does uh, in this life? And the ultimate purpose of, of punishment. So uh, we begin with Deuteronomy 19.16, which is, uh, involves how do you handle someone uh, and there's a, a, a great Bible story about this, the Nabob's Vineyard story. But what do you do with somebody who falsely testifies against someone in order to have them punished? You falsely accuse them of murder. You falsely accuse them, in Nabob's case, of blasphemy. And your hope is to make the judicial process your unwitting tool in murder. So you falsely accuse someone for the purpose of convicting them of a a wrongful crime. If this happens, we're told, the judges must make a thorough investigation. And then, do to the false witness as he intended to do to his brother. You must purge the evil from among you. Now, so far, this is very retributive. But God is also uh, aware and teaches that doing this, punishing this person in this way, will have another kind of consequence, the kind of consequence that people in the world say should be the only kind of thing we consider in punishment. Deuteronomy 19.20. The rest of the people will hear of this and be afraid and never again will such an evil thing be done among you. Show no pity, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, and foot for foot. What is the, the last reason that the Bible gives, that God gives us for strong punishments? If you punish strongly when someone does something like this, people won't do it. If, if you do to someone what they intended to do to someone else, then people will not do that. There will be a horror of that. 
there's, there's a, a, a wonderful uh, writer, uh, Fitz James Stevens, who was a great commentator on uh, English law when modern theories of, of law were coming on, when people were saying, uh, you shouldn't have retributive justice. And he used to say, well, uh, many men perhaps will not commit murder because they're afraid of being hanged. There are some people who are thinking about committing a, a murder or another crime, and they think, ah, if I do that, I might get hanged myself. But he said, if there are a few people who think that way, there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands who will never think about murdering somebody because they have a horror of it. They don't fear getting hanged. They would never even think about murdering somebody because they have a horror of murder. Because when murder occurs, all the reasonable people of the community gather together and applaud the hanging of the murderer. It produces a, a, a deep abhorrence in people's hearts. A few people may calculate and think, can I get away with murder? But for the mass of people, what strong punishment does is it creates an abhorrence, a horror, a, a sense of, of awe that keeps them from doing it. This is the effect of deterrence that, that God describes. But we get a hint, even in this verse, that there's more going on here. God says two things. He says, do this so that other people won't do it. They'll be deterred. But he also says, you must purge the evil from among you. A purge is, is a, a word that is a, a cleansing word. There's something, there's something wrong with the holiness of society. Society's relationship to God is off. This is the way David was talking in the 101st Psalm. Look, I don't want any evil around me. I, I don't want evil advisors. I don't want evil companions. I, I want to purge the land. And this is a very different uh, idea. Because what David is speaking of is his works of justice put him in the right relationship to God. And of course, as we saw last week, that is the fundamental basis of criminal justice in the Bible. It's, it's not a deterrence. And again, I, I quote to you from Genesis 9. Genesis 9 do, does not say, if uh, a man sheds blood, you shall fashion an adequate deterrent. It does not say, if a man sheds blood, then you shall shed his blood in order to deter, in order to make people afraid of bloodshed. Obviously, Deuteronomy 19 would lead us to expect that's true, but that's not the reason that's given. The reason that's given for the shedding of blood of the one who murders is because man is made in God's image. Though the one who murders another person strikes not just at that man, but at God. There is a defilement of God's order, God's plan, of God's image uh, in, in the world. So um, I like thinking of criminal justice as just a social technique where we use kind of advertised punishments in order to scare people from punishing and we, we send them to workshops so they can get high school degrees in jail and become better people. And uh, you know, real maniacs we keep locked up in, in nice rooms so they don't hurt other, other people. And all we're, all we're really doing is the same thing that advertisers do on, on TV. It's the same thing that governments do by creating incentives for people to do things. We're not judging and punishing people. We're just managing them. We're, we're social controllers. Um, I, I, I would like to be a social controller of other people. And I would like to, to manage them like objects. That would make me very intelligent. And that would make me more in control than them, so I would be very satisfied with myself. I'm speaking facetiously uh, now, I hope you understand. Um, but it would free me from the sense that God tells me, if I were a ruler, that I act on his behalf. What God tells the rulers of this world is, you are my agent of wrath, not my agent of social control, not my agent of, of sociological insight into 
into how to stop recidivism. You are my agent of wrath. And if I were a ruler, seriously, that would scare, scare me. And it's supposed to. Rulers are supposed to be scared. This is given to rulers to make them afraid. What you are doing is carrying out, in advance of Christ's coming, the wrath of God on evildoers. That's your role. And if you don't do it right, God is right there at your shoulder judging you. So be afraid. Fear God only in your judgments. Don't fear man, because man has nothing to do with it. But we don't like that, because if that were how we thought of government, then every time a criminal sentence is executed, there is a claim being made that God judges, that this is a manifestation of the wrath of God, a partial manifestation of a much more thorough judgment to come. Now rulers judge the outside, but a day is coming when God will judge the outside and the inside. The outside, maybe I can bear. I haven't committed any murders. That's okay for me. But the inside, and of course, this is what Jesus uh, reminds us of. It, it's not enough not to kill. Uh, but how have, you, how have you spoken to your brother? What anger has been in your heart? And he assures us that that will be judged just as much. I, I want to illustrate for you this war. The, the Bible clearly teaches retribution. That the basic reason you punish is because people who do something bad deserve it. And specifically, we're going to treat murder today. The basic reason that you punish murderers is because they deserve to be punished. Uh, this makes us uncomfortable. And I want to give you an example of this, uh, this discomfort. Uh, this is from a, a case, Furman versus Georgia, which you may also study in, in uh, criminal procedure or in constitutional law. It's a constitutional case. And it overturned all of the death penalty laws in the United States for a time. It was later uh, reversed, uh, in a sense, uh, and the death penalty exists in the United States today in some states. But at the time, this brought a total cessation uh, by the, the, the will of the Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme Court could not agree on an opinion. They, 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 they uh, had seven concurrences. Each justice wrote their own concurrence. Uh, each justice had a different reason for uh, overturning the death penalty. But I've chosen two examples that I think are, are uh, evocative or telling or paradigmatic of the reasons that were given. And the reason that was given is basically, we're modern people and we don't believe in retribution anymore. We don't believe anyone deserves punishment. We don't believe that people should be punished because they deserve it. We believe in doing things because they further social purposes for the future. And this is dressed up in a spirit of enlightenment and having escaped from a, a brutal past. But I think the only thing they've escaped from is confronting their sinfulness and the reality of, of judgment and the need for us not to tell ourselves we won't be judged, as Paul warns about in Romans 2. He says, you think you're not going to be judged? Come on, guys. Are you hiding from yourselves the fact that you're not going to be judged because God is merciful to you now? Are you telling yourself you don't need the, the grace of Jesus Christ and to walk and live in him because you live in a time of, of mercy? You're fooling yourselves. There is a judgment. Jesus' blood is the only answer. This is what they're hiding from themselves. So this is one of the great uh, justices of the modern era, uh, Justice Brennan writing, a, a truly great uh, intellect and one of the most influential uh, justices in the, the modern revolution uh, in, uh, in Supreme Court law and ideology. He is, to me, uh, uh, admirable in his, his personal skills, but a, a great evil man. 
Uh, at the same time, this decision was, was being handed down, which banned the death penalty for murderers and rapists. The court was also handing down Roe v. Wade, which created the right to kill innocent babies. So understand uh, the way that modern evil works. Uh, modern evil uh, does not seek to avoid the destruction of the innocent. It seeks to avoid the destruction of the wicked. And it does that because if the wicked are destroyed, then we have to look at ourselves. But if the weak and the unborn are destroyed, uh, we can dress it up in terms of liberty and freedom. So this is a, a great justice and perhaps the most hypocritical man in the history of the Supreme Court because he both endorsed, uh, a, in the name of human dignity, as we'll see, refusing to punish murderers, rapists, murder rapists, torture, mass killings, all of these things he said were beyond the, the, the power of the state uh, to, to punish with death. But he said also that the unborn child may be killed with impunity. Innocence, no protection, but the most evil in the land, maximal protection. A vicious, hypocritical, evil genius. Evil geniuses are real. Uh, they don't all twirl their mustache. I can do that. Uh, this is one of them. Here, here he writes, from the beginning of our nation, the punishment of death has stirred acute public controversy. Although pragmatic arguments for and against the punishment have been frequently advanced, this long-standing and heated controversy cannot be explained solely as the result of differences over the practical wisdom of a particular government policy. At bottom, the battle has been waged on moral grounds. The country has debated whether a society for which the dignity of the individual is the supreme value, can without a fundamental inconsistency follow the practice of deliberately, deliberately putting some of its members to death. Now, I think he's, he's, he's speaking truthfully. If you're trying to be persuasive, it's always good to begin with truths. It is obvious that the, the question of the death penalty has always been supported as it has been throughout the entire history of the church and indeed throughout the history of the world up to the modern period because of moral grounds. It is the, the judgment of mankind witnessed as we'll see in the scriptures that certain crimes, particularly murder, are deserving of death. They deserve it. This is a moral judgment. It is a, a judgment about the proportion between the wrongful act and the punishment. The, the Bible says first, as we see, it is appropriate for a, a blood shedder's blood to be shed because we are made in the image of God. The, the murderer has done something against the image of God. So it is appropriate. It is, it is measured to that. That's a, a, a moral judgment, a judgment of, of justice. And that's been the basis of it. Everybody's agreed on that. You'll notice what Brennan interposes. I mean, he, here, uh, here the lie begins. He says, this cannot be consistent with a country for which the individual is the supreme value. And I, I quoted him a little bit wrong. Not the individual is the supreme value, the dignity of the individual is the supreme value. This is not a constitutional word. The word dignity doesn't appear in the Constitution. It's not part of, of the, uh, the common law tradition that he's, he's referring to. Uh, dignity is, is a, a term that comes from a Roman history. The, the dignitas romanitas was the, 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 the sphere of special rights that the Roman had uh, that, that non-Romans didn't have. That was part of his dignitas. Uh, but it's simply a, a, a bizarre entry into a constitutional opinion to claim that the dignity 
of the individual is the supreme value. Why then do we send people into war? Why then do we administer vaccines that we know will kill some people, cripple some people, injure some people, uh, in order to save the whole country, so we say. Why do we do any number of things that we know will kill individuals uh, if we think the value of the individual dignity is the supreme value? There is not a document in American history that says the dignity of the individual is the supreme value of the United States. We value individuals. But we also value the nation. We value individuals, but we also value justice. One might have thought a, a U.S. Supreme Court justice would think that justice was the supreme value of the United States, not the dignity of the individual. In the United States, I'm continuing on now, in the United States, as in other nations of the Western world, the struggle about this punishment has been one between ancient and deeply rooted beliefs in retribution, atonement, or vengeance on the one hand, and on the other, beliefs in the personal value and dignity of the common man that were born of the democratic movement of the 18th century as well as in the beliefs in the scientific approach to an understanding of the motives of human conduct, which are the result of the growth of sciences of behavior during the 19th and 20th centuries. On the one hand, you have the ancient and the dark, the deeply rooted, the bowels. And on the other, you have democratic movements of the 18th century coupled with scientific understanding into the, the wellsprings of human conduct and motivation. The, the ideology here that, that Brennan is, is running is that the modern period belongs to a new enlightened democratic age when we have lifted up the dignity of, of man from non-democratic society into democratic ones and we have lifted up man from uh, the, the gross ignorance of his passions into a new age of science and enlightenment. It is this essentially moral conflict that forms the backdrop for the past changes in and the present operation of our system of imposing death as a punishment for crime. Shortly stated, retribution in this context means that criminals are put to death because they deserve it. Excellent. That's exactly right. And now listen to how Justice Brennan twists the idea of desert. Although it is difficult to believe that any state today wishes to proclaim adherence to naked vengeance. I saw that movie in the 80s, Naked Vengeance. It was Sharon Stone. No, that was Basic Instinct. I got, I got confused there. Although it is difficult to believe that any state today wishes to proclaim adherence to naked vengeance. So now he's suggesting that the belief that some people deserve punishment is an adherence to naked vengeance. This is a, 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 a complete failure in basic conceptual analysis. Retribution and desert, the idea that some people deserve punishment, and the idea of vengeance are clean different concepts. Vengeance refers to a, a private violence against those we're angry with in return for a crime. With somebody who is unauthorized, who doesn't have the right to act in God's place, acting in place of the proper authorities, and taking vengeance. Retribution refers to the one who is the agent of God's wrath punishing people in proportion to their desert. And so he, he's, he's deliberately trying to elide two very separate concepts here. The states, the states who are defending the death penalty, claim in reliance upon its statutory authorization that death is the only fit punishment for capital crimes and that this retributive purpose justifies its infliction. This is exactly what the scriptures teach. 
This is exactly what uh, uh, Christians have always supported, have always recognized the legitimacy of. Uh, when Paul is in, before Festus, he says, look, if I'm deserving, if I've done a crime worthy of death, then kill me, execute me. He doesn't say the supreme individual dignity of my, of my person requires you to let me live. The thief on the cross next to, to Jesus watching his, his soon-to-be Savior dies says, look, I deserve this. I deserve this, but you're innocent. And Jesus doesn't say to him, oh, my friend, uh, you misunderstand. The, the supreme value of individual dignity means that no one should be crucified. No, he says, you'll be with me in paradise tomorrow. Then uh, Brennan engages in some nice social relativism. He says, look, no values are real. Justice isn't real. Justice is just what societies decide to do for their own purposes. We are, we are self-making, we are self-creating. We have, we have learned from the science of the 18th, 19th and 20th century how to manipulate ourselves. We've learned the science of human conduct and how to manipulate them. And we can change our concepts of justice. Obviously, he says, concepts of justice change. No immutable moral order requires death for murderers and rapists. He says, out of hand, it's impossible for there to be an immutable order of, of justice. I wonder how he would feel about uh, somebody who showed disrespect for a justice of the Supreme Court if he was met with the reply, there is no immutable moral order that requires me to respect you. There is no immutable order that requires us to obey the orders of the Supreme Court. I wonder how he would respond. I bet things would get a lot more immutable quickly. The claim that death is a just punishment necessarily refers to the existence of certain public beliefs. It's just all subjective. It's whatever the public believes. The claim must be that for capital crimes, death alone comports with the society's notion of proper punishment. Let me point out, by the way, this is a door that swings both ways. If you say that our notions of punishment are not grounded in an objective moral order, you can say that today we want to get rid of the death penalty. You could also say that tomorrow we would like to impose some old-fashioned punishments. Uh, the Romans had some other punishments that they used. You're, you're familiar with one of them. Whip someone almost to death and then nail their, their arms to a cross until they suffocated. People have lots of interesting ways of, of killing people. The Romans had, a, if you killed your parents, the Romans would put a, a fox or serpents into a bag sew you into the bag, and then throw you into the Tiber River. That's how they did it. Uh, lots of societies have tortured people to death. Lots of societies have opened people's fronts, let their, their bowels uh, spill out, cut them off, and then burned them to death. Pulled their limbs apart with horses. Is Justice Brennan suggesting that if tomorrow we decide those are appropriate punishments, that there's no absolute standard of justice that would prevent those things from being appropriate. He isn't suggesting it. He has stated it in terms. But he believes because of the democratic movements of the 18th century and the advance of science and enlightenment that history is moving in one way. Well, history is not moving in one way. Sin has not been abolished by science. No science of behavior from the 19th and 20th century has enabled us to extinguish the social ills that we face today. Murder is exploding in the United States. In one year, last year, murder increased by 30% in the United States. Almost all in certain places and, and localities in the United States so that in those areas, the murder rate is higher than our soldiers faced when they were fighting in Afghanistan. We have not solved through our behavioral science the problems of humanity. And as for our democracies, 
The greatest effect of our democracies has been to unleash the greatest wars in the history of humanity, where democratic societies, because we identify the enemy as a people, were targeted with attacks on civilian populations in the most egregious manner that no evil aristocratic society had ever dreamed of. So after his, his, his relativism, uh, he concludes, but as the changing history of punishment of death in this country shows, our society now wishes to prevent crime. We have no desire to kill simply to get even with them. And of course, this is a, a ludicrous thing to say because the whole reason the case is there is because the overwhelming majority of states in the United States did not wish to get rid of the death penalty. They wanted to have the death penalty for the reason that they stated. They thought it was deserved. They thought that people who killed and people who raped deserved to die. And uh, for Justice Brennan, the, the relativist, Justice Brennan, the abortionist, Justice Brennan, the bloody, Justice Brennan, who, who ushers in our, our new public age of devaluization and subjectivity and the denial of any limits on punishment except the will of the people, his glorious people. Whatever they will, that is justice. He sounds like Adolf Hitler. It is a vicious and hateful and uncontrollable doctrine. The will of the people does not establish justice. That is a lie. It is a lie that man can live without a sense of what is right and what is wrong, punishments that are deserved, things that should be rewarded, and things that should be punished. But this is the same man who brought the death of millions to abortion through abortion in the United States. He exonerates the guilty and he condemns the innocent. Because what is there except what the people want? Well, there is something other than what the people want. There's what, what God has taught us are, are real objective values, eternal values of justice. And one of the things that God teaches us, praise God, is that society should not uh, punish people just to use them to create social effects. A government should not run society as if the people were uh, uh, animals that we control by ringing bells and uh, making them salivate, by feeding them at regular intervals, by shocking them with electricity, by, by punishing and manipulating them. You're supposed to Manage people as if they're made in the image of God. And that means that they know good and evil. They can choose between them and they have responsibility. And this is why God's law teaches that it's appropriate to punish. Uh, the next uh, three uh, uh, scriptures uh, all deal with this, this same uh, theme the basic principle of proportionality of punishment. You should punish people in accordance with what they do. That's what they deserve. They deserve that punishment. So Exodus 21, 22, one of the first earliest uh, laws in the Bible. If two men are, if are fighting, hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely, but there's no serious injury, the offender must be fined, whatever the woman's husband demands and the court allows. But if there is serious injury, you must take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, and bruise for bruise. Now, as you can, you can tell, actually, uh, the phrase burn for burn does not necessarily mean that you have to burn someone. It, it is, as you can see over in Leviticus uh, 24, uh, verse 21, oh, excuse me, verse uh, 18, this formula, life for life, can also refer to compensation. It can refer to either replacing an, an injured, uh, injured animal with a, another animal or paying compensation for it. 
If anyone takes the life of a human being, this is 2417, he must be put to death. Anyone who takes the life of someone's animal must make restitution, life for life. It's a very important passage, by the way, if you're trying to understand what the, the formula, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, means. Oftentimes, people think it means that you have to knock out a tooth if someone knocks out a tooth. This is wrong. Uh, in the most explicit case dealing with teeth, for example, if you knock out the tooth or an eye of a slave, you pay him compensation. The law does, does not say you should have your own tooth knocked out. What it says is the slave should go free. The slave is given his freedom as compensation. Um, so we, we know through further adumbration of the law, development of the law, this phrase does not mean you have to take a life for a life. Uh, the, the grammar of this and why it means that is, is very apparent if you, if you study it. I won't go into it here. But uh, Leviticus 24, 18 is a critical passage for you if you want to understand the meaning of eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, because it specifically says life for life in the case of taking an animal does not mean that if I kill your animal, you kill mine. That's how people understand life for life. That's not true. What you're supposed to do is replace the animal. You give life for life in the sense of you give the equivalent to what you've taken. But God says in the case of death, if you murder someone, you don't do that. No ransom can be paid. Compensation is not sufficient. When you have done this, you have done something that deserves bloodshed in return. That is the desert. That is the deserved response. Now today, uh, some people argue about this. I've, I've just given you a, a reference to a good paper. Uh, future, further on with death penalty cases, the Supreme Court argued a lot about does the death penalty, does it deter crime or not? And uh, be, because the left in the United States loves to kill babies but hates to kill uh, murderers and rapists, the leftists in the academy have, have, have done all that they can to try to muddy the waters on this issue. Just as the justices uh, of the United States federal courts have engaged in an unconstitutional, illegal, and dishonorable campaign of, of deliberately uh, obstructing capital punishment. Uh, when I clerked for the Eighth Circuit, whenever there was a capital punishment in Arkansas, uh, we would stay up all night to deal with the flood of, of late, uh, late last second habeas petitions that the judges had to rule on into the early hours of the, the evening, which quite frankly, were all frivolous, uh, but enabled the, the, the structure. And so we have a, a very, very long structure uh, for execution to occur in the United States. The, the scriptures make it clear that the, the problem of bloodshed is not just deterring crime. It does deter crime, it creates a horror of murder it's not just incapacitating murderers. Somebody is executed. They can't murder again. Uh, in the United States, according to the statistics I read last night, uh, what, what we do on average, someone who murders another human being in the United States serves 15 years of, of imprisonment. The, the punishment for murder on average, some are longer, some are shorter, but the average incarceration for murder in the United States is 15 years. If you murder somebody when you're 17, it's necessarily a shorter period of time. But if you murder somebody uh, when you're an adult, the average sentence is, is 15 years. So uh, somebody uh, kills your wife over uh, her purse, and then uh, you, can, you can see her, uh, her or him uh, walking around as free as you in 15, 15 years. According to the FBI statistics, 5% of those people uh, recommit crimes of either murder or uh, major violence, major violent acts. Uh, so um, I guess it depends on how much you, you dislike murder, if you think that's a, a good thing or not. But, but the Bible is not so much concerned with the level of deterrence. It assures us that these things will happen. It's concerned with another problem. Or it puts the same problem in a different way. Deuteronomy 19, 11. If a man hates his neighbor and lies in wait for him and assaults and kills him and then flees to one of these cities, the elders of his town shall send for him, bring him back from the city, and hand him over 
to the avenger of blood to die. Show him no pity. Now at this point, you might say because man is made in the image of God or because if you show no pity, it will lead to deterrence. We, we saw that, that before. But this time it says, you must purge from Israel the guilt of shedding innocent blood so that it may go well with you. And this refers to the, the fact that scriptures teach very plainly that when murder happens in a society, it is stained. There is a problem. The, the blood cries out from the ground. Uh, we, we learned about this with Cain and Abel, uh, the blood of, of the prophets. Uh, those who are, are wrongfully killed, their blood cries out from the ground. This is expanded a little bit in Numbers 35, 33. Do not pollute the land where you are. Bloodshed pollutes the land. And atonement cannot be made for the land on which blood has been shed, except by the blood of the one who shed it. Not only is, is there a problem about uh, when someone deserves punishment, not delivering it, but there's a deep problem with societies that allow people to murder and then walk again free after 15 years or less. There, there's a great problem with a society that punishes people for murder as much as they do major bank fraud. There is a, a problem with a society like the United States that retains the death penalty for treason, for attacks on the president, for attacks on Supreme Court justices, for attacks on federal officers, but then says in the name of science and humanity and individual dignity, if you kill uh, uh, my grandmother, nothing. We, we will sentence them to the, the same amount of time as we do for any number of acts. This is an unclean society. This is an unholy society. This is a, a bloody and sick society. This is a society that does not honor man, not in his individual 18th century democratic dignity, but man is made in the image of God. And we have abhorrent statutes in the United States today dictated by Supreme Court policy that say the death penalty is only appropriate with certain kinds of aggravation. And you can read the, the politics into this. If there's, if there's uh, a gun involved, then you can put someone to death, but not if they use an ax. What sense does that make? You, you can put someone to death if there is torture involved. You can put someone to death if there's a child involved. Well, all of those are good times to put people to death, according to the scripture. But what if it's just my grandmother that you beat to death with your hands, you sickos? Not an aggravating factor. What if you kill my grandmother with a knife? Not an aggravating factor because it's not your, your, your hatred of firearms doesn't apply to it. We today say, oh, no, no, we, we only kill people when they really, really, really make us mad. Uh, different societies that have outlawed the death penalty practically or completely say, oh, we need to have the death penalty for mass murder or for sexual murder or for murder against children. That's great. But, you know, if somebody murdered me, I think it would be pretty bad, too. If somebody murdered my wife, I think it would be pretty bad, too. What makes murder bad is not aggravating circumstances. What makes murder bad is that it destroys the image of God. And this is, I think, what the, the scriptures mean. Bloodshed pollutes the land, and if you don't respond to bloodshed, but only to an increasingly awful set of lists of things that sufficiently aggravate you enough, like most societies retain the, the, the death penalty for treason, even if they don't retain it for, for murder. Well, I get treason. That's bad. But so is murdering any human being. I'll conclude today with, with uh, Deuteronomy 21. This is a, a, a passage to, to think about. 
it deals with what happens very often in the United States. In many U.S. cities, uh, the clearance rate for murders, solved murders, is falling below 50%. So more than half of the murders uh, go unsolved. We, we find a dead body, and we have no idea who did it, and the police uh, are never able to identify a, a culprit. And as I say, particularly in, in some uh, limited areas in the United States, I'm familiar with one of these. I'm, I'm proud to say St. Louis has been the, I'm not proud of it, of course. St. Louis has been the murder capital of the United States uh, many times in, in recent, recent years. Um, so I, I've grown up in a murderous, bloody uh, society, uh, which may explain some of my sensitivity to the, the horrors of bloodshed. If a man is found slain lying in a field in the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess, and it is not known who killed him, your elders and judges shall go out and measure the distance from the body to the neighboring towns. And then the elders of the town nearest the body shall take a heifer that has never been worked and has never worn a yoke and lead her down to a valley that has not been plowed or planted and where there is a flowing stream. And there in the valley they are to break the heifer's neck. And the priests, the sons of Levi, shall step forward for the Lord the, your God has chosen them to minister and to pronounce blessings in the name of the Lord and to decide all cases of dispute and assault. And then all the elders of the town nearest the body shall wash their hands over the heifer whose neck was broken in the valley. And they shall declare, our hands did not shed this blood, nor did our eyes see it done. Accept this atonement for your people Israel, whom you have redeemed, O Lord, and do not hold your people guilty of the blood of an innocent man. And the bloodshed will be atoned for and so you will purge from yourselves the guilt of shedding innocent blood since you have done what is right in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, I end with this, this passage because this is a, a clear foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. Uh, as the, the people who find themselves in a land polluted with, with bloodshed offer up an, an innocent heifer to atone for the blood that they can't atone for. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to get themselves out of the situation. The land is stained with blood, and so they offer up this innocent heifer. And they say, don't hold us guilty, Lord, because we, we offer this innocent uh, heifer in the place uh, of the bloodshed we cannot cure according to our own means. I, I think uh, Justice Brennan, who again, as I say, is a, an absolutely phenomenal uh, talent in, in law, uh, I think he is responding to a very deep crisis in the United States, which is if, if you've ever seen a, a street where there's been a killing and you've seen the, the blood on it, if you've ever seen an automobile accident and seen the, the blood spread on the, on the ground, uh, you, you don't feel neutral about it. You feel horror. It's horrible. And, and the, the blood of those who are murdered, the blood of those who are, who are destroyed in, in the very being of the image of God that they, they are, when you see their life spread out on the ground, it cries out to you. And men like uh, Brennan, who, who through their previous work had created the largest acceleration of crime in U.S. history, in the name of justice for the common man and the democratic decency of individual dignity, America went from one of the safest societies in the world to one of the most dangerous. This is the science of 18th and 19th century behavioral control at work. Apparently what these scientists wanted to do was to make us a bloodier and bloodier and bloodier society. And that's what we're doing. Or, Maybe their problem is they have to run from the fact that they can't cure the land of the guilt of bloodshed. If you don't believe that punishment is deserved, if you don't believe that you're acting for God as an agent of his wrath and that the punishment of the wicked fulfills his will and atones for bloodshed for the land, well, then what are you doing as a judge? What's your point? And so he denies that there's any desert for judgment. He, he has to deny that there's any role for, for judgment and 
desert. Because how else can he save himself but denying that there is judgment and right and justice? This is, after all, the man who launched an assault on a millions of unborn babies. Well, they can do that because they have nothing else to do but to, to hide from their own guilty conscience and to suppress their knowledge of what is wrong. But, but you, my friends, cannot. The, the scriptures have taught you the law. And the law is that bloodshed must be answered with bloodshed one way or another. Atonement must be made. For you and for me, we face the same pressure as Justice Brennan. We don't know how to make atonement. But we're like the people of the city. The lamb, the heifer, has been sacrificed. We have, we have identified ourselves with that, that lamb. It has died in our place. And so we're not guilty of bloodshed through the power of Jesus Christ. That's the joy of our salvation. Not that there's no judgment. There is a judgment. The joy of our salvation in Jesus Christ is we have security in the judgment through his blood. But as it pertains to civil law, the United States is driving itself insane when the highest court of the land says, Nobody deserves judgment. Well, murder and crime and rape, destruction of property, burn out of control in our, our cities as a result of their failure to face up to the God who has given them the task of being his agents of wrath, a witness to us of the coming judgment. Now, this is the world we live in. Praise God that we have Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, it is, it is terrifying to hear the denial at the highest levels of authority of your most basic truths, of the, of the truths that, that draw us close to you. Let us cling to Jesus, not deny judgment. Let us live in, in faith and not as fools. Thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ which has purified the bloodshed, which has made us holy before you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.